Hello, everybody. I'm John Barnwell. I'm here north of the city of Detroit, Detroit, the Straits. I'm here with Pastor David William Perry in the city of London, a merry old England. And we're here to explore truth as a meta narrative. What is, what is this truth thing? And uh, Rudolf Steiner was, was very clear about what he thought regarding truth and that he said, just go out there and tell truth. Go out there, give lectures, do talks, and talk about things that are true. And so I think that that's a nice affirmation considering I didn't see that quote until after we had already done umpteen episodes of What is Truth, and we're still exploring. How you doing there, Pastor David? Well, always a pleasure to speak to you, John. Our, our weekly weekly gathering of clans. Um, yeah, I, I, I had the flu bug that's going around here at the minute, and I've still got a hacking cough. Although the flu bug has left me, and I'm wondering how how true it is that they're tampering with the weather and the skies, and we're all getting poisoned. Although that said, I get the flu bug at this time every year, and have done for a number of years. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but yeah, everyone's dropping down with it like flies. Um, can't really see much of a future for Britain at the minute, um, or Europe. Um, which no one should take particular pleasure in because then the world is genuinely destabilised. Um, and, you know, it's hard, it's hard to keep optimistic, but I'm a sick bunny at the minute, so I'm doing my best. Also, I'm a, a tired bunny because, of course, we had our monthly service of worship, which nearly always kills me. So doing all of that, then rushing here, is, is not making David the most positive of people, but I'm doing my best. How about yourself? But other than that, you're doing great. Other than that, I'm doing great, yeah. Well, fortunately, our, our vistas are wider than all of that mundane activity, although that's there. There's, But that's your proving ground. And, you know, it's like uh, T.S. Eliot in the Wasteland. You know, and you have that the image of Parsifal having to travel through the wasteland as a result of not being able to ask the aging Grail King, Brother, what ails you, as it's depicted. And so it's that whole idea of how are we connected to each other? What is what is the point of all this? And and what is unfolding through all of this activity. And people have been given ample opportunities to step up over the last few years, to say the least. And uh, it's important that we keep in mind certain seed thoughts. I think it's, it's really a good uh, capacity and, and so I'm going to just share this, this brief quote from Rudolf Steiner to kip, kick us off here. I've read it before, but I think that people could use it all the more today. And I quote, We must eradicate from the soul all fear and terror of what comes towards us out of the future. We must acquire serenity in all feelings and sensations about the future. We must look forward with absolute equanimity to everything that may come. And we must think only that whatever comes is given to us by a world directive full of wisdom. It is part of what we must learn in this age, namely to live out of pure trust without any security in existence. Trust in the ever-present help of the spiritual world. Truly nothing else will do if our courage is not to fail us. Let us seek the awakening from within ourselves every morning and evening, end quote. Yeah, so it's like we're out in the desert again being 
by the brook being fed by the ravens. And so it's it, it becomes this challenge of being able to become uh, centered in, in your worldview. And yeah, there's going to be bumps, of course, but the, the whole idea he, he's saying here, equanimity, that's that to not let things get one agitated because that just kind of puts a fog over the windshield, so to speak. <laughs> Anyways, I thought I'd share that again because I think that's a good touchstone to begin today's adventure into what is truth. And we're almost to 100, David. How about that? That's, that's something. You're looking comfortable there. You you no 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 trying to beat off bugs. I mean your and your your link was so stylish and sophisticated. I wasn't sure it was a link. Um, I don't know. I'm trying desperately not to talk about politics and exploding pipelines under the sea. So don't talk about politics. No, but I have to mention a few things. I think <laughs> um, because I spent the last day or so. Um, with my better half looking at Rod Sterling, I always knew he was a bright uh, and incredible guy. I didn't really realize to, you know, what, what sheer substance the man had. That, it was really taken me by storm. <clears throat> you know, and a Twilight Zone fantasy genre, sci fi genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's clearly, you know, I knew he wrote plays and I knew he was a, a, a um, you know, I knew he was a, a sort of jobbing, independent jobbing scriptwriter for major movie studios and TV. But what I didn't know was the level on which he'd been a cultural commentator um, and the, the depth of his analysis about modern literature, which really took me aback. Um, so I'm beginning to, I don't know, wonder what's gone wrong with America and what's gone wrong with Europe and what's gone wrong with Britain. Um, because if people like that were speaking at that depth not so long ago, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and I noticed he was worried about the dumbing down process um, back then. I mean, I don't think he would have, I think he'd have been horrified about how far it actually goes and is still going. You know, and I found a marvellous meme by Carl Sagan about how he was, you know, the one thing he was truly afraid of, the one thing he was truly outraged by, was the present glorification of stupidity, um, which, of course, is deliberate on the part of the powers that be for all sorts of reasons. Um, yeah, it's my, it, I don't know. I'm, I'm, pessimistic isn't the word. I'm not a pessimistic person for the simple reason there is a saviour and the battle was fought 2,000 years ago and the battle has already been won. And as my dear, dear uh, ancestor in in a spiritual sense john bunyan would have said as we said it to each other before you know the, the the great pilgrim poet be of good cheer friend for all is well but at the moment it's very difficult <coughs> excuse me saying that i mean i don't know how much you've seen of affairs in britain over the past week um yeah how how much lower can we actually sink before the country itself begins to sink? Um, it, it's it's almost like a death wish on one level, but it's manipulated <clears throat> only by international markets, some of whom are clearly not on the side of Britain and not on the side of Europe. And they, they are sinister forces in their own right. And I'm not thinking of the Russians. Um, you know, it's hard to know how much lower things can actually sink without genuine disassembling starting to take place. And then who benefits? Absolutely nobody. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't get pessimistic. I'm not a pessimistic sort of person, <clears throat> but I am a concerned person today because this week has reached new new depths. I mean, uh, uh, one political thing I will say um was that, uh, that you know, this is the season of British political parties having their party conferences. So, you know, lots of booze, lots of rhetoric um, and nonsense like that. <clears throat> so the Labour Party, I think that was last week, was <coughs> came away from the conference speaking as though it actually was already in power. I mean, for God's sake, you're not. Mr. Boston, in order to have a strong England, you must have a strong America. I've no doubt of that, Mr. Boston. I've no doubt of that. 
Uh, we are Twix together, like it or not. I've never disliked it. Um, God bless America. Yeah, I mean, the united we stand, the stronger we stand. Mr. Boston, I think I've read that one. I think I've read that one. <coughs> <coughs> Um, you know, as I said on, on this show a number of times, you know, any any country that can have, um, oh, God, the name is gone. He's one of my favourite gangsters dancing down the stairs of the president. Um, Mr. Boston, by the SES and British control over patent offices. I'm not sure what that means. You'll have to forgive my lack of conspiratorial. Right, I'd have to explain it to you. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a conspiracy that, that theorist. He's, Mr. Boston. He's I'm making sorry. reference to my involvement with uh, American intelligence media. And we did the big expose on the SA, SES. The, it's the senior executive service. Basically, right. it's the civilian generals, the Privy Council uh, image of the U.S. here. And it's that whole idea of that they're, they're in position that they can't be fired by the executive. And they're beneath the cabinet posts, and their job is the implementation of decisions that are made in cabinet or the stopping from implementation, you know, get in the way uh, muddy up the gears, you know, so to speak. And so, you know, there's just uh, incredible uh, the number of uh, bureaucrats that we have in this country, as in your country, you know, and it's all woven together. You know, there's no question about it. I mean, the FBI, the CIA, both came out of the British nest. And we can prove it. We have all the documents. Go to American Intelligence Media. Go to Americans for Innovation. You can do all that. And But we generally, that isn't what we're doing when we're here. And so uh, I was just showing before the show started uh, a book. I, I was moving some of my books around. The Anthropology of Johannes Scotus Erigina. And he was the gentleman in the court of Charles the Bald, you know, after Charlemagne. And when you get into uh, the writings that were given to the, the uh, court at that time from the emperor of the Eastern Empire, Michael the Stammerer, uh, gifted copies of the writings of Dionysius, the celestial hierarchies, the divine names, and all of those documents of which are the most quoted, uh, second most quoted sources in the writings of Thomas Aquinas, and central to the understanding the work of Rudolf Steiner. It has to do with the ninefold hierarchy of the angels, archangels, archai, and the Exusiae and Dunamis and Curiotes and Thrones and Cherubim and Seraphim, that that whole series is uh, a reality, a dynamic reality. And that was the tradition that was taught out of the school that Paul established in Athens with Dionysius, the Areopagite. And the Writings were put out in fourth century. They know from the style of the Greek and the documents, so they tend to call them pseudo Dionysius. Well, yeah, the, the original Dionysius didn't write it down, apparently. It was an oral tradition, and his successors all took the name of Dionysius, uh, which is interesting and plays a prominent role in the whole understanding of uh, one's place in the world in the tradition of the Greek heritage. And so where would we be without St. Paul as far as uh, Christianity as a cultural impulse? Uh, not that it would necessarily stop Jesus Christ, because even if we didn't find out about him, he would get his mission accomplished. And uh, we've been given the opportunity to be able to participate in the deeper understanding of this uh, Majesty is the only way you can describe it because it's it's 
tremendous and, and continues on and on and on. And so at some point, one might come to the realization that through equilibrium, you can find a path towards clarity. And it's the clarity that will give you understanding. And out of this understanding will arise wisdom. But wisdom is the fruit of suffering. Um, I think it's unwise to abstract Jesus Christ from the picture. Um, <laughs> yeah, he seems to have something to do with it all. Um, yeah, I, I've always been fond of St. Paul. I think he's a very misunderstood character. And there's almost sort of a, a militant tendency to work against his legacy at the minute, not only on the level of serious theology, um, and they, they have every right to discuss in academic terms, what they've discovered. I'm not saying that. But, you know, there, there seems to be some weird, he can't have been right about this, he can't have been right about that. Let's put him in the context of his time. Oh, no, we don't know what he meant. You know, it, it seems to me, I don't know, needlessly destructive for the sake of it, as opposed to deconstructive, which I can understand. <clears throat> you know, I mean, I, I went to something... Uh, uh, um, an open sort of forum at King's College years ago uh, where, uh, oh, no, they were discussing John Wisdom. Now, there's a name for a philosopher. And um, who had written something dismissive. What was it, the Invisible Gardener? You know, how can we tell God is there or not? Imagine you're in a garden with an invisible gardener. Does he exist or doesn't, doesn't he? Daniel Wickett, some of you Paul as a heretic, yeah, and some view him as, as as the Easter Bunny. I mean, no, you know, um, heretic for what? Against who? Um, so it's a, 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 a guy that had an experience of the Christ energy. So how does that make him heretical? Um, if we want to go to the Jewish model of Christianity, which is perfectly legitimate, where Jesus is some sort of highly qualified rabbi, uh, also claiming to be a messianic king, of which, of course, there are many in mainstream Judaism, then you could say he was a heretic to the Jews. But was he actually talking to the Jews? Um, you know, I mean, and I know that when the Bible mentions Greeks and Romans, it actually refers to Jews living in Greece and Jews living in Rome. I mean, so it was a, an insider's book for insiders in that sense. Um, and he was, yeah, I mean... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, Paul goes around ruffling feathers, first of all, when he's killing people because they're not Jewish enough. And then when he's not killing people because they're not Christian enough. So, you know, you're looking at a complex character. I can't see how anyone could justify the claim of heresy because I, I don't know against what. You know, a, a heretic must be in reaction to a tradition or stream of thought or school which simply can't have existed by his in his age, by his time. Um, I, re I remember reading, uh, what was it, Kazantzakis, Nic Nicholas Kazantzakis, can't remember, Christ Recrucified, that was made into a movie, of course, with Willem Dafoe. The worst casting for the Jesus figure in human history, who on earth thought of Willem Dafoe to play the Christ character. Give it a rest, darling. And who overacted in every single scene of that movie. And of course, there's there's the confrontation between Paul and the Jesus figure. And the Jesus figure says to Paul, <clears throat> you can't save people by lying, which is meant to be the big reveal in this movie somehow. Now, to be fair to Kazant Zakis, who was interested in Gnosticism, he did seem to think there was a there were you know many layers and threads behind what was going on and the simplicity of the teachings of Jesus, were they? Kazantzakis would have said that their simplicity was betrayed by Paul, who comes up with this cosmic vision. I don't go for it. Um, you know, if you're a very talented Greek and there's a bottle of Retzina to the side, you know, and you want to tell a good yarn, yeah, good. And it's a brilliant novel. It's an absolutely brilliant novel. But and again, creators have every right to speculate and experiment with materials. Why not? But to suddenly have a, a confrontation like that in the movie, which is a very far cry from the book, 
where you have the Jesus figure. Conf I can't remember who played St. Paul. It's, uh, you know, some typical Hollywood bit part. Um, and there's this, this sort of agonized moment between the two of them when St. Paul says, I hope nobody's shocked. It's a line in the movie, as far as I recall it. The sooner you're dead, the better. Look what I've done for you. And you think, no, no, please, no, no, no. Uh, there's not the shreddest, slightest shred of evidence. There's not on, on an internal plane or an external plane that that, that would ever have occurred, that that could have occurred. What, what Paul spoke about was his experience with the Christ. And the Christ by that time was not simply a human being, was not simply a man, if that's what he was in the first place. <coughs> so I don't go for any of that, that, that stuff. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, John. Um, no, I think Paul is the victim of history in the sense that he's a much more comprehensible figure to us than Jesus Christ. And he's a much more historical figure. Um, we can understand someone like that. We can understand their motives. We can understand their career. Um, and the fact he was so energetic and busy means he carved a niche into European society, irrespective of whether it was Jewish or not. You know, and I mean, Caligula's reaction to Paul, I mean, the, you know, the the emperor himself hears um, of, of St. Paul's trial. Um, I, I can't remember the swathe of documents. There are some documents on all this. And, you know, and where, where at first... Caligula's dismissive. I mean, you've got some Jew claiming he's a Roman. You know, and in those days, if you're a Roman citizen, uh, you know, rather like nowadays, you know, armies of lawyers suddenly come out the woodwork and they're trying to defend and prosecute everybody in sight. So it was exactly the same back then. And at first, the emperor's dismissive. And a couple of years later, when there are literally hundreds of people congregating around the hut of St. Paul to hear what he's saying with his weekly preaching. Um, then all of a sudden Caligula's attitude changes and he says something, I can't remember the actual quote, forgive me, uh, thank heavens for imperial stenographers, but I can't remember the quote. Uh, you know, the Jews always want, what was it, the Greeks always want a philosopher and the Jews, the Jews always want a sorcerer to set them free. I mean, it, you know, it's about time he came to trial. Um, that, that is incredibly telling and interesting. You know, but what what Paul is doing is not trying to usurp or twist something that hadn't had time to become a tradition. What he's trying to do is, in the modern term, witness to what his experience was and how that might be important to other people. <coughs> the trouble is, of course, when you're dealing with a pre-literate culture, which in many ways it was, uh, but judged by modern standards where you just grab a book from the bookshelf, as John has just done, when paper is so expensive, not even large institutions really want to foot the bill too often. When educated people who are scribes are actually really quite thin on the ground and cost a lot of money. You know, so, so you know, what people did was, was practice oral tradition, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's proved its salt. It, it's proved, I and mean, there are many pre literate cultures in the world now that prove they're... <laughs> You know, they can handle text, albeit not written text. <clears throat> what they did, of course, was not only create around themselves mystery schools. I'm thinking of the apostles as well as St. Paul. But uh, disciples, you know, disciples of disciples. So the whole thing gets disse disseminated through different circles of people. And that's how the texts were formed and how they were gathered together. And how they became eventually written down. And Paul is doing the same. Paul initiates a mystery school because he, he didn't just, you know, I, mean, I don't think people really appreciate what happened to him. You know, a, 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 a pillar of blazing light that speaks to him. I mean, it's not, that's not a usual experience. You know, that would, if that happened to me, you know, I'd be in bed for a week trying to recover. You know, you're not looking at, oh, hi, Paul, you know, how, how's it hanging? No, 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 no. You're looking at something of the, the most extraordinary external power with uh, an incredibly significant internal meaning. And that is what Paul is trying to communicate. Um, and certainly you get pseudo-Paul. Not all of it is written by Paul. 
some of it is written later by people. I mean, in the ancient world, it was considered arrogant um, to put your own name to a, a, an original or a significant document, a historically significant document. So what they used to do was write in the name of. So you get Paul's secretary, you get pseudo Paul. Uh, you know, if Paul was here, what he would have said was, and that's when the whole thing goes a little awry. Also, I think if you're looking at letters taken out of context, which are actually answering, you know, specific questions, they're not just these meanderings, uh, that gives a very different impression of what Paul was doing. But yeah, I think John's entirely right. You know, you're dealing with a mystery school of an incredible depth that's trying to retrace the steps of Paul into the mysteries of this Christ energy. Because um, what else would you call it? It's not a human being that speaks to him. Uh, you know, the, this consciousness, this divinity, uh, in, I'm using that in a general sense, not a divinity, this divinity is somehow expressing itself to a murderer and, you know, lifting him up and healing him at the same time and asking him to go as he asked the disciples to spread the message. And the message, as always, is one of love and wisdom and tolerance. I mean, the, the, I can, you know, if that was done, if a modern psychiatric patient, that's not being disrespectful, turned up to a clinic or a group of physicians and say, look, I've had this experience. And if they believed him, they don't always rule it out. I mean, I, you know, there'd be a conference about what he meant by the basic terms. Um, no, I mean, you're looking at something not only that shook the man to the core, but formed the type of school whereby these energies, it was felt, could be shared. An extraordinary man of extraordinary gifts, immense erudition, historically noticeable. Um, and we need, I think, to start picking up those pieces, both analytically and in prayer, before we can even dream of getting to the figure of Christ. What do you think, John? Well, I think that at this point, it's on our shoulders to take up the task. Uh, Rudolf Steiner said uh, in the lecture cycle, planetary spheres and their influence on man's life on earth and in the spiritual worlds, the threefold sun and the risen Christ, the lecture he gave in April 24th, 1922. It's Collected Works 211. But this quote is powerful. I mean, it probably at this point in history, you would be liable to get the greatest number of people who would be willing to consider its content. And you'll see what I mean by that when I give you this and I in quote. It is of the first importance that there should be in this present time a certain number of people who know where man stands in his spiritual evolution and know also what must be his next step if civilization is not to go completely under. For what is happening today? In speaking to you, my dear friends, I can use anthroposophical terminology and say at once that the aramonic forces which are at work whenever man thinks or acts on a materialistic basis, are in our day trying to chain man to the earth by gaining possession of his intellect. They are at this moment very powerful, these harmonic forces. They are searching out all kinds of ways to get access to the souls of men with the object of enticing them to the adoption of a purely materialistic outlook, a purely intellectual understanding of the world it is on this account important that there should be, as I said, a certain number of persons who know how the evolution of man has to proceed in order for him to reach his goal, end quote. And so that kind of gives you the, I mean, you have to consider the time in which this was, was going on. Uh, it's very much... Uh, a critical point in, in European history and world history for that matter. I mean, the in the interim between the two world wars and the the uniqueness of what was the activity in Dornach during 
the first world war where they were building the Gertianum, the first Gertianum. There were people there from all the countries of, of Europe that were involved in the fray. And of course, uh, Switzerland wasn't in on the gambit. And so you had all these people there from all these countries all over Europe helping and working together in building this, this uh, testimony to the relationship between mankind and Christ is essentially what probably the shortest definition you could give of the Gertianum impulse. And so you have this and it, it, you see that there's a certain strengthening that comes when you give grace access into your, into your uh, thought realm, that you have to have the humility to realize there's things you don't know, but there is something you can do about it. And that was the point that, that Rudolf Steiner repeatedly made, is that the language of Christ is a time language. So you have to learn the language of time and, and begin to study history with an understanding of the nature of the spiritual influences that were acting upon mankind at that time. And I, we keep reiterating and reiterating, but you can't figure out what in the world I'm talking about if you're just functioning as a space being. Are you saying we should all become time lords? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it was in the philosophy of that period anyway, you know, Heidegger starts suggesting that we've got to make a greater understanding of time and duration in our lives, you know, sign und Zeit. So it was the time we started talking about time. As usual, Steiner goes head and shoulders beyond everybody else. <clears throat> but that, I mean, he's an addict. So <clears throat> in one sense, it's interesting to see what people who weren't adepts, excuse me, were saying about that sort of, excuse me, zeitgeist. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's just got me back. I'm, th I'm, I'm quite fond of St. Paul. Um, you know, uh, one minute he's a boxer that can't stand women. Uh, the next he's a tent maker worried about profit margins. Do tent makers worry about profit margins? You know, and then he's a runner, which explains some of the metaphors. Um, I think we need secular history, um, which is one of nearly a forbidden subject nowadays, isn't it? We need secular history to begin unpeeling, to begin unfolding, unwrapping what those people were like, what the biographies were like, what their psychologies were like, what their contacts and their world was like as a litmus test to some greater truths. Um, and I think that's possible. And I think St. Paul, curiously, is the most approachable of all of these people, um, of all of these great, inspired, enlightened. I mean, how can people say the in, in apostles weren't enlightened? <clears throat> you know, what, there's one thing in Buddhism I noticed years back that they're always saying we're just beginners. You know, uh, um, my own view of Buddhism is highly respectful, but I tend to regard it as a philosophy. And look how far philosophy can go. Um, I do not tend to regard it as a religion. I think that's lazy sociology um, trying to fit a philosophical school into a religious context because there are lots of lazy people about nowadays. Um, but, you know, they're always saying we're just beginners, we're just starting out. Well, okay, let's look at people who are not saying that, who say we're well and truly on the path and we're, we're, we're walking down it, like the apostles and the disciples. Um, but approaching them, I mean, you know, they've, they've been next to the Christ energy for a number of years. You know, that, that by definition must be a lot. I mean, they didn't understand it. They knew something of supreme significance was happening and happening to them but they couldn't unpack it they couldn't they couldn't contextualize it because there was no context therefore i think the likes of st paul and that's not said in any sense to belittle it is really much more than a simple bridge to understanding the mystery of mysteries you look like you want an entry there john <laughs> well i think that the, the key to how we struck this conversation starting off, you know, and, and that was in mentioning 
John Scotus Irigina. He was from Ireland. He was a scholar who knew uh, Greek and Latin, and he, you know he was just the, one of the le most learned people of the time. And so th there was a, another uh, monk who attempted a translation of the the uh, works of Dionysius, but they weren't very good. And then uh, apparently uh, Johannes Codus Herodina showed up during the reign of Charles the Bald. And so you have this, this uh, happening that, that is developing, you know, as we move from, from the eighth through the ninth into the 10th centuries, this whole uh, development in thought, which Rudolf Steiner describes how there's this, these two different streams involved in, in understanding European culture, because you have the Southern stream is that stream of the intellect and you have this highly developed literate cultures uh, in the Mediterranean basin, but then coming from the North, whereas that would be the, the, the tree of knowledge. The, you know, going back to the biblical image of the tree of knowledge, and then there's the tree of life. And he said that it was the Northern Europeans that didn't have that intellectual culture, but had this, this basis of integrity in, in the way in which they uh, approached their life task. And, but without the intellectual understanding and, and the coming together when, the, when they came in and, and ended up the, going through the, the taking over of Europe by these uh, wild Goths and, and Germanic tribes. And, you know, if you want to find out about some of that, you have to go to uh, one of the few people that has given any account because these are pre-literate societies is Tacitus, you know, where he goes in there and he goes into detail about the different uh, names of, of the various tribes. And they each had their own integral approach. And, and in looking at this, then you have to understand that, that in coming to approach these Northern mysteries that you have to get into the uh, mysteries that were established by Scythianos in the North and, and the mystery center on the black shores of the Black Sea. And likewise, establishing that mystery center in Ireland and so you have this, this circle of, of mystery uh, places. And, and you have the, the stones in Paderborn, Germany, for example, the extern stones. And so you have these various locations in which this cosmic mystery is being uh, expressed to people, but in a, a pre-intellectual form coming into and revivifying because the latin stream Rudolf steiner says on its own on its own it would have just like kind of dried out and 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 become this this lifeless and i'm paraphrasing but this the, the impulse was running out of steam and they were able to inject a new vitality into uh the contributions of the mediterranean basin so that's a fascinating concept to consider but when you get into uh, Johannes Codus Herigina and, and that he did a translation that was remarkable. In fact, your old buddy, uh, Bertrand Russell, he, he managed to comment that Johannes Codus Herigina was the most remarkable individual of that time dealing in the history of ideas. And so you have certain key initiates, but again, you can go back and, and you read about Ireland in, the, in those early uh, periods. And it said that simple farmers could read both Latin and Greek. So it had its own uh, vital uh, system of schools in England that of course were then uh, pushed into uh, destruction by, by the good old Brits. But uh, nonetheless, they had a, the great schools there and people would travel from very far away to go. And, and before the schools were, were established, with the Druid centers that were there. So you have this, this tremendous uh, location on earth. And Rudolf Steiner talks about how that Ireland actually was 
uh, a remnant of the continent of Atlantis that had sunk into the sea. And so you have this, this uh, geographical mystery. And a, a lot of people get confused. They get into the whole idea about races. But really, the, the key to understanding these things is to get into the, the geographical mysteries. Because back in, in the ancient world, if you wanted to come into contact uh, with like uh, the Jupiter mysteries, you'd had to like go go to the uh, a place where they had them, you know, go to the Bergenland, and you know, or or go to uh, uh, over in Wales, you know, so that there's a certain uh, relationship to these the, the mysteries of the metals and copper mysteries and mysteries of gold and silver, and so you have these impulses that are very much tied into what is the natural. Uh, environment. Uh, you get, you know, for example, the French uh, putting forth that they, they were descended from uh, the the wedding with with a water nymph, right? Yeah, yeah. Melusina, the myth, myth of Melusina. You know? So that, what is that? Why are they doing that? And Rudolf Steiner indicates that the, the British uh, folks saw, well, it comes out of the element of earth. It's a, to France, it comes out of the element of water. And, and Italy, out of the element of air. And the, the Central European impulse is that warmth. And it's that warmth that's the impulse that is being carried through this, this uh, northern tree of life. It's, it's That's what's giving vitality to it. And it. But it does it in a cultural way. So you look at so how is it accomplished? Well, you get guys like Bach and Beethoven, Mozart, <laughs> and you go, if that isn't uh, uh, giving life to the cultural impulse, I don't know what is. Right, let's begin with the Frenchies. Shut up, Francois. You'll say anything to try and upstage the British. Don't believe a word of it. Um, Oh, God, some aquatic going on that proves you should run the world. No, 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 no. Anyway, weren't the Merovingians guilty of deicide or something? Uh, no, 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 no. Not having, not having any of it. Um, what is France good at? Spectacular cuisine. Incredible, incredible wines. Um, and being annoying. There we are. That's France. That's a mystery of France. John, yeah. Oh, yeah, I like what Goethe said. He said, mathematicians are a kind of Frenchman. Whenever you say anything or talk to them, they translate it into their own language. And right away, it is something completely different. <laughs> right, no, listen. Now, um, every time I've gone to France, I used to speak much better French than I do at the moment. I'd more than adequate schoolboy French in the past. Every single time. You join in a conversation in France. Oh, Monsieur's English, and then they just do everything in English from there from there on to try and be awkward. Bugger you, Francois. That's what I say. Um, eat your snails. That's the only thing wrong with your cookery. Eat your snails, um, and I don't care if it comes with incredibly well salted garlic butter. I don't care, um, and I'm quite willing to admit it's a delicacy, but I don't care. There we are. Um, oh God, right. Uh, you know, God created France to show how beautiful the world could be, then created the French so nobody would have their nose put out of joint, rude bastards. Um, right, so that's the French done with. Um, yes, I, I, I am guilty to having known Bertie Russell. Um, you know, what interested me was, was the Quaker bit. Um, Bertie would never... Um, you know, I met him a couple of times. I, it wasn't an in-depth bosom buddy thing. Um, but, you know, I know he was proud of his Quaker heritage because he told me. I knew, I know, even though he wrote books like Why Not a Christian, that he did think becoming something, someone like a Quaker was absolutely legitimate. Um, so he doesn't dismiss the whole of religion. He What he doesn't like are uh, the orthodoxies of institutionalised religion which he seems to feel go awry far too often. And they're used as vehicles of political and ec economic control. And that got up his Quaker nose. They don't like things like that. There, there we are. I mean, his, 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 his um, partner, um, marriage would be wrong when you're dealing with someone like Bertie Russell. 
they they had I'd been to the the meeting house. He I can't remember her name. She was a Quaker too, and I think she was some sort of mathematician. They had a Quaker ceremony in a Quaker meeting house. <coughs> Excuse me, and I'd been to the meeting. House. <coughs> so I know. I know he's um he's not you know there's more to him than meets the eye when it comes to things like religion and he's actually got an incredibly sophisticated but very quaker view of it all you know so i'm not saying he's a practicing quaker i'm not saying he's a theist i am saying when you're dealing with someone of that sophistication be very careful about what you think you know about his work and you know and i had the privilege of having a couple of things unpacked a little for me which made me think you know that's really interesting um all right uh northern mysteries i'm beginning to turn against the whole viking malarkey um i saw right john yes uh perhaps i should finish i make my comment about bertrand russell uh, you know he had four wives so i don't know which one you're referring oh, to. i think it was the first one you know I, the first one it's this really old picture of him looking very young so it must be very old uh alice pearsall smith that's it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so forgive me i mean i just remember this old picture with everybody looking at her just about to get on penny farthings and ride down the road um Right, I maybe I should have been slightly more eloquent and not, not let the flu get to me. Of course, they were very literate cultures back then, but they were pretextual in many senses if you compare them to modern times. So they were more than literate. In fact, the, the reading age of ancient Athens was way above modern London. Somebody studied it recently, uh, which doesn't surprise me at all. But, you know, they, they were challenged by the mechanics of actually producing text <laughs> or, you know, in a manifest, in a written form, because it was so expensive. <laughs> Oswald Spengler, that John Barnwell, would Russell and Wittgenstein as a duo be considered Quagan? What an interesting comment. Okay. Um, people have to read both of them more carefully. I mean, I used to make the joke about Wittgenstein being the most religious atheist in human history. Um, he does claim to have had a series of mystical experiences, of course. I mean, you know, what, what's the common denominator there? They don't like polluting higher order values. They don't like dragging down celestial things, transcendental things into earthly things. They they both have a, a predilection against that. You know, for Bertie, uh, religion, quite rightly, is the inner experience. You know, are you, what, what do Quakers say? You know, are you trying to find the inner light? The inner light is the Christ light. And certainly for Wittgenstein, who I know a little bit more about, maybe ironically, um, you know, it, it again, it's a very personal experience. <clears throat> he had a very Protestant, dare I say, view of it all, whereby it's between you and the Almighty, and any nobody else really has uh, any any right to get involved. I think that's a bit too far, but I mean, it's in it's certainly in philosophical investigations, and I think there's been a book recently. That I can't remember it offhand that was published that goes into detail about his religious views and his mystical experiences, uh, which he kept quiet for many years, not because he was embarrassed by them, not because they didn't fit his philosophy, but because he felt they were private business and shouldn't really be shared, um, like some of the very great mystics. Um, and, you know, for him, it was, I mean, the big thing with Wittgenstein is pollution, you know, cleanliness, purity. And it, it's very clear from what he says, even in the philosophical investigations, that to do that somehow drags these sacred things into the public domain where they simply shouldn't be. Um, and they're both against organized religion. You've got to remember that. Uh, I find the word Quagan useful. I, mean, I find it a different way of saying Catholic, curiously. Uh, Quagan, of course, would be a Quaker-inspired pagan. I tend to put myself in that type of category. What, what else is anybody? Um, I find the Quaker uh, style of worship very much to my taste. Um, you know, uh, intense silence whereby one is waiting for the Holy Spirit to contact us, to speak to us. John? Has he cast? Yeah, I mean, it, it's on the verge of Gnosticism. It is hesychastic prayer. I, I agree 100% with that. Um, and I used to go regularly to the Wandsworth Meeting House 
and came away intoxicated. I confess it. Um, you know, so on, all right, on a sociological level, on a psychological level, um, you know, why was it so potent? Because what's the one thing you never get in London? An hours of an hour of silence. But there were, you know, that wasn't the whole story. The fact we were looking, everyone was looking in their own way for the Christ light within themselves. And there was somebody, because of course you can speak during a Quaker meeting. Uh, somebody sometimes would speak in ancient Hebrew. I noticed uh, occasionally there were Ahmadiyya Muslims um, who eventually prepared breakfast for everybody um, at one of the meetings. Um, and me struggling with my nascent paganism. I mean, it, it all felt good and right and proper. And the Christ was clearly there. The Christ energy was clearly there in those meetings and in us. Um, which is why I suppose I'm turning against Northman at the minute. Um, I've also had a thing about uh, North European culture. I still do. Excuse me. At the end of the day, my academic interests always end up with Kierkegaard and Scandinavia. It's just, I always get drawn back there. There's a purity. There's an intuitional potency that's in no other part of Europe. Not to mention Emanuel Swedenborg. Um, I've got to the stage now where I can't talk about Swedenborg. I find him overwhelming. Um, if I was asked now to write that book, I wouldn't be able to because there's just so much information. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know where to begin now. Uh, you know, so I wrote that book at the right time, John, because every time I look more at Swedenborg, there's. I mean, it's like Steiner. You know, you you think you've got hold of the gist of it, then three years later you read something else. And I thought, oh bugger that was completely wrong yeah and then all these other materials you know manifest out of nowhere and you're oh god i haven't seen any of this before i mean swedenborg is a one-off um and it's because he's a naturalist it's because he's a scientist who has the keen analytical eye of a trained scholar for the inner super sensible worlds that for me was the ultimate powerhouse back then and in many ways it is now you know the the, the real example of, of a western shaman uh who spent 30 years exp exploring and explaining his works there's nothing like it now but i i've got to the stage now where i can't i actually can't write on swedenborg anymore i nearly can't read anymore swedenborg uh because it's just too much i need to take a couple of steps back from that before we go any further so right in answer to oswald's question i think yeah, I think Quaganry, curiously, is the religious estate of, of North Europe. Um, it's a bit pagan, it's a bit Christian, and it's something to do with the great depths that we find ourselves in. I mean, I'm against the whole new Northman thing. I mean, I saw, uh, I think I said to everybody on this show, we saw the Northman, that bloody Willem Dafoe again. Why can't he retire? I mean, at this time, he's the king's something or other trying to pretend he's in there with the warrior lads. How old are you now? And there's that Nicole Kidman, right? I, I normally like Nicole Kidman. Love, you are not some sort of weird chieftain's queen. I'm sorry, no. You know, who, spends, who tries to get under the fact she's out of her depth by combing her spectacular hair in nearly every scene. You know, no, no. I mean, the bit that annoys me most uh, and there is some truth to it, which is why it annoys me, um, is the Northmen are on their, their long boat. Didn't they ever do anything else? And they're going down a river, as you do. And, you know, all of it, there's a, a, a husband, there's a father and a son on a little boat. And you think the Northmen, the Vikings, uh, are, are going past them. Then all of a sudden you hear the swish of two arrows and there are two dead bodies on the boat. And you go to the back of the barge and the, the the archers looking guilty but amused and laughing. And then they all start laughing along with him. Well, then they're savage, murderous bastards, not lovely, heroic, free spirits. Um, and it's that type of tainting um, that we get without Christianity. I noticed Christianity didn't have a look in. Uh, you know, the... the, the what were, what were these people before Christ and what were they after Christ? And those aren't trivial questions. Uh, you know, I noticed, what was it, Bjorg as a witch, love, you've been an old witch for years. 
But, you know, we've got to think, OK, the different types of consciousness in Europe, all of which are important, all of which need to be treasured and all of which need, because they still haven't, reached their fruition. And I agree with you 100%, John, you know, the literate textual cultures of the South, yeah, the, the intuitive nearly, I mean, it's nearly on the verge of uh, artistic genius in the North. Uh, but uh, without the Christ energy bringing balance to all of this, I despair because we're going back to that level of savagery very, very soon if we're not careful. I'll hand it back. Well, I brought to mind something we used to discuss early in, in the episodes of this particular series, What is Truth? But uh, because David is the author of a book that is on Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg and the Arts, that's edited by Daniela Hadi Irandus, the very talented. And but in dealing with Emanuel Swedenborg, uh, he's included in the study that. Uh, Stanford University researchers, they attempted to calculate the IQ of the history's greatest minds. They applied what's called the Terman Standard. It's after uh, Professor Lewis Terman of Stanford University, who was the one who invented IQ testing. And, uh, the, but they, they applied it to a massive database of, of historical mat material. And there were, there were only three people that scored above 200. And that was Emanuel Swedenborg, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and John Stuart Mill, the author of On Liberty. And so it's fascinating. They're, they're still working with that database, although the, the original people are now in their 80s, you know, but uh, truly remarkable. I was looking for this one quote. I'll, I'll find it for a future episode of, of Emanuel Swedenborg. He, but he is. He was truly remarkable scientist, like uh, Goethe, polymath, as they would say, you know, uh, excelled in numerous disciplines. But uh, David's other books, I might as well go there because I already started. So you have his major work, of course, that's Mount Athos Inside Me, uh, and you have his grammar of witchcraft which gets into the quagan theme uh it's it's part and parcel of british culture you have it in shakespeare you know it's just it's just a part of it you know and so it's it's to be expected a haunting conceit according to ian sinclair uh that and the third volume is the caliban's redemption the shakespearean as poetry and these are available on um, Amazon, along with the philosophy of education towards an anthroposophical view by Daniela Hadi Irinduced, which is a very interesting study that evaluates Waldorf education within the context of a lot of modernist and postmodernist ideas, which is not uh, the usual fare, shall we say, when one's approaching the subject. So it's it's very fascinating. And uh, for myself, my first book uh, has gone out of print, but soon to be reprinted, hopefully. And uh, Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of its underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the true Rosicrucian Order. And as a forward by my best buddy, Douglas Gabriel, at some 640 pages with extensive series of diagrams that I inherited from Aaron from Pfeiffer, cosmological diagrams. And I added a great many more. And then I did my second book and I added even more. So. Uh, that's the Arcane of Light on the Path. I still have copies of this. It has a forward by William Bento, the noted astrosopher and psychologist. These are uh, the, the uh, Arcane of Light on the Path is still available. You can get it on uh, eBay if you're within the continental US 
or if you're outside the country, you can contact me through the academia link below or by private message on Facebook. And if you're inclined, uh, buy us a cup of coffee and that's paypal.me forward slash D Perry 777 or paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And uh, no amount's too small and that uh, helps keep moving thing on, keeping the lights on as they say. But uh, that being said, uh, back to you. I think there's a little bit of a pagan in everybody here because of our history and the length of our history. Um, I wanted to show everyone this, which is what I'm reading at the moment. Um, Ithel, some people say Ithel, yeah. Ithel Colcahoon, um, who of course was a major painter in the British Surrealist movement. Uh, which is how I knew her until reading this book. It's incredibly well written. Uh, a beautiful exposition of her life in Cornwall. She mentions Atlantis and the Atlantean energies, which she feels are palpable in, in her area. I didn't realise how sensitive she was. I knew she got thrown out of the British Surrealist movement for her interest in occultism, which strikes me as bizarre. I mean, if you look at John... She did a marvelous book on relative to the Golden Dawn tradition and Dion Fortune and, and just on and on. I mean, she's she's quite uh, penetrating insights. I guess my memory was a purple book, purple dust jacket on it, but uh, that was that was uh, important at the uh, at that time at that early time that people were start just starting to get there i mean still to this day there are people out there that are are uh william butler yates scholars and they don't even know that his his wife who he married at 52 was an anthroposophist and they might not even know what that is you know so it's that's the the state at which we're at and coming to terms with understanding of cultural impulses uh, within mass culture so it's it's interesting to i always like to be able to look under the hood and figure out what the actual influences were it's difficult in britain in a certain regard because many of the people there belong to clubs in saint james and all that and they have these fantastic libraries in them and you don't know if people go in there and just just read the daily news or they're or they're digging through the library you just don't know and uh so it's kind of sub rosa as they say it's a very discreet and so you you have that kind of a, an approach and but that being said i know that you you gave uh, a powerful service today's sermon and uh, you seem a little a little frayed around the edges my friend but so if you want to uh, share your prayer we can we can let you go and seek other adventures uh, i am more than frayed around the edges <laughs> um, um yeah i hope we give a powerful monthly service as i say it may be our penultimate service because uh, my partner and i might be relocating i don't know yet um to bonnie scotland um so when the food riots break out and the all the rest of it the civil unrest and the illuminati finally decide to trash the system we will be out of the way in food forests and all the rest of it and there's an element of, of truth to that mr boston i have been to mount athos i am a greek orthodox by the way father mr boston i didn't know that and i'm very Honoured that you shared that with me. I mean, I was really examining Mount Athos not only as an internal spiritual estate. Um, it was really also about sort of the orthodox but not non-Byzantine voice that you find everywhere in English literature, which apparently nobody had, had written about before. I find that bewildering uh, because that's actually a very significant influence. That's a, a very significant orthodox influence. Yes, John. Well, you have uh, Faber and Faber, right? It, uh, T. S. Eliot was an editor there for for uh, a while, and but they ended up uh, 
what the Philokalia was published through Faber and Faber, and which is one of the most fascinating documents of this oh, kind. Of, uh, yeah, I mean, I I read some of the Philokalia. I, I, I mean, I think everybody knows who watches this show. I have a deep resonance with Christian orthodoxy. Um, I find it beautiful and powerful and very, very deeply profound. But that wasn't the purpose of the of my Athos book. And I noticed nobody actually had... They want to talk about the Byzantine cultural experience, of which actually there's very little. But no one wants to talk about the pre-Byzantine or non-Byzantine voice, which is also a well-known stream in orthodoxy. So, I, I, you know, it was a weird little niche that, that maybe I discovered by accident, but uh, nobody's paid me the slightest courtesy in discussing it with me. But so there we are. Um, because that's how the cookie crumbles. Uh, I'll just say one thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid to bits. And, of course, I've got this bloody hangover of the flu. So um, there's there's all that going on today. Uh, not been at my best, but I, so I apologise to everybody. But I'll be fighting fit, hopefully, again. But for next week. Um, and I'll just say a prayer that I read earlier at our during our service. I mean, it's a version of the uh, of, of the act of repentance, and I'd like to say it with all of us, for all of us, until we meet again. I think John knows, as a friend of mine, how much I love this show. I hope all of you watchers in the present moment and yet to come are also aware I actually do mean it when I call this a little church. It's a little mosque. It's a little synagogue. It's a place of prayer, reflection, and worship. And I'm very happy and very proud that we're nearly approaching our 100th episode. I think that's quite a, a milestone. And that's thanks to John, um, who puts up with an old, short, fat British Platonist uh, week in and week out. Um, yeah, I mean, we've made, we're making headway. We're looking at the language of the angels and it's an honor to be with everybody so regularly. But as I, I was saying this earlier, because I think the future is for a Quagan future for St. Valentine's Hall. Um, and that is the British religious consciousness. I'm writing about it at the moment. It does come up in Athos, and I'm writing about it at the moment too. But this is one of the things we say in uh, St. Valentine's Hall. When we get to the stage, you know, before we receive communion, before anyone receives communion, there should be an act of repentance, uh, which can be interpreted in a number of ways. Um, we are always less than worthy before God. God is God and we are what we are. But, you know, how many of those blocks, how many of those sins, how many of those obstacles are we putting up as opposed to God reminding us that we need Redemption. What, what are we doing in this complicit process? <clears throat> so one of the things I always say in the lead up, I'd like to share with you all now. We are here in the spirit of Jesus Christ. We are here because we are human. But we deny our humanity. We are stubborn fools and liars to ourselves. We do not love others. We war against life. We hurt each other. We are sorry for it, however. And no, we are sick from it. We seek new life. Giver of life. Heal us and free us to be human. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us to listen for we are very deaf. Come, fill this moment, fill our days ahead, and fill our hearts with your presence of infinite love and wisdom until we all meet again. Amen. Amen. Well, that was, that was powerful. Uh, and before signing off, I'd like to just single out a few individuals. Uh, this podcast is made possible by the generous support, of, especially of, of Tyler and Douglas and Vadim and Vivian and uh, Ray and Whitney and James and Marilyn and, and numerous other people. And uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up and those that did make it for the live show. Uh, greetings to all those who catch this later on. And 
Thank you so much, David. Uh, you have a wonderful rest of the day.